Welcome, everybody, to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Hope everybody is doing well today, and thanks so much for joining us. Boy, do we have a tremendous guest who's coming to us from New York City. Award-winning author, writer, renowned theater critic extraordinaire, Christopher Byrne is joining us here on the show, and he's going to be talking about a very, very special book that is literally hot off the presses, and we're so excited to have an opportunity to really share it with you. We're also celebrating the life of renowned playwright Terrence McNally. And we're so excited to have this opportunity to do this. The name of the book is A Man of Much Importance, The Life and Art of Terrence McNally. And literally it is just hot off the presses. Now, Terrence himself, if you're familiar with Terrence, and I'm sure you are, but if you're not, from his earliest plays in the 1960s to his death in 2020, Terrence McNally has been a force in American theater. Beginning in the off-off-Broadway movement, Terrence's writing continually reflected a changing culture from opposition to the Vietnam War to the emergence of AIDS, gay rights, and more. His stage plays, musicals, and operas continue to be performed internationally, and they remain the work of a consummate artist, delving into the human soul and fearlessly examining both the lighter and darker aspects of existence in an uncertain and sometimes frightening world. This really is a very, very special celebration that we're going to be doing here on the show. I want to let you know that um, our very special guest, Christopher Byrne, is a prolific writer. His, he loves writing, and this, is a, this has been a real labor of love for him to put this together. It's been something that he's worked on for a long time with Terrence McNally's blessing as well. How beautiful is that? And filled with extraordinary interviews as this iconic figure in American theater and American entertainment is celebrated so lovingly and glowingly. A man of much importance looks at Terrence McNally's life and work against the backdrop of a dynamic theatrical culture, tracing the ways in which an artist grows or responds to his world based on extensive interviews with Terrence. It also features interviews with many of the artists, actors, designers, and producers with whom he collaborated, including Nathan Lane, Cheetah Rivera, Audrey McDonald, Christine Baranski, Kathy Bates, Susie Kurtz, John Glover, and so many others, Paul Libin, Lynn Meadow, and many, many, many others. You know what's great about this too? It presents a warm and affectionate look at the people and practices that are unique to theater and performing arts. Author and theater critic Christopher Byrne really has gone beyond a traditional biography, illuminating the evolution of an artist, not merely just as an individual creative force, but as a figure situated within a collaborative, independent community of artists who inspire one another and give voice and dimension to the artistic process. Now, Christopher himself, that's Terrence on the screen there, and this is Christopher, who's our guest, is an author, theater critic, and since 1996, he has been the contributing theater editor for Gate City News and is the editor of Connecticut Voice. He's a member of the Drama Desk and the American Theater Critics Association. He began his career as a stage manager and producer and as a graduate of Boston University's College of Fine Arts. In his not-so-secret double life, he is a leading expert on toys and play. What a cool thing to be a leading expert on, huh? Hey, I still have all my Matchbox cars and Hot Wheels and Mom Saved the Red Fire uh, wagon, fire engine wagon, still got that. <laughs> He's been writing extensively, including seven books, speaking and appearing on many television programs worldwide on the topic. He's also a creator and host of the Playground Podcast, a B2B podcast for the uh, international toy industry. That's business to business, of course, as well as Voice Out Loud, amplifying diverse voices in the LGBTQ plus community as well. And uh, the book, again, just came out recently so we're very excited to have this opportunity to talk about the book because it is literally hot off the presses there again is the book itself and uh it's something quite special it is a definitive look at this iconic figure and uh, we're so excited again to have an opportunity to celebrate terrence and also celebrate christopher here on the show terrence again a man of 
of much talent. There he is in earlier years, and there he is in a more recent. Of course, we lost, as I mentioned, Terrence, um, and it was a very sad loss. I mean, the, the coverage, the media coverage was quite extensive. And uh, reason being, he was a beloved figure and responsible for so much extraordinary theater and music and also helped the careers of many, many people uh, who have become incredible stars within the theater community. So this is very exciting, folks. And if you want to comment during the show, our, well, I guess in radio, we would say our phone lines are open, but in this case, our Lovely Hall chat room is open and you can comment right now while the show is live in the Lovely Hall chat room when you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, which costs you nothing. Just subscribe, click the uh, notification bell so you never miss any notifications about all the great episodes, hundreds and hundreds, almost a thousand episodes we've done. And you can comment right now and uh, interact with all of us and with each other as well which is quite special. All right, coming to us live and direct from the Big Apple, Christopher Byrne is here, and it's a pleasure to welcome him. Christopher, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. It's so nice to be with you. So nice to be with you as well. How are things where you are? Nice day, beautiful day. Uh, it's a gorgeous day. It's a little, it's a little hot, it's a little uh, sunny, but it's called summer. So we're enjoying, summer. we're enjoying the heat and the brightness, yeah. Except for our viewers watching in Australia, South Africa, a place like that where they are enduring a rough winter, I hear. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. flip things upside down, you know, where the water goes this way. <laughs> right, right. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's an upside down world. Uh, so great to have you here. Congratulations on this. I know it was a labor of love. And before we even get to it, I want to learn, I like to uh, humanize the guests, whether it's this show or my professional work in television and radio. And I love for people to have an understanding of your insight, your perspective, who you are, to then really doubly appreciate the book itself. What inspired you? What are some of the inspirations in your life growing up that pointed you in the direction of having such a thirst and passion for the arts and for theater and for entertainment and wanting to revel in it, produce it, share it, write about it. Well, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. I went to a small school called the Tower Hill School where my parents were both teachers. My father was the head of the middle school. So when I acted out in fifth to eighth grade, guess whose office I was sent to. Um, and we, uh, it was a really supportive, creative childhood. My parents were very much into literature into the arts. My mom would take us to Shakespeare from the earliest ages. She made sure we knew all the stories from like Charles and Mary Lamb's Tales of Shakespeare. Uh, I have three brothers. I was the one who glommed onto all of this. I thought it was amazing and I went every chance I had. And it was really a chance to create and express myself. And I really, I really loved that. I really loved the way in which it was uh, a very supportive, creative environment. And we grew up near Philadelphia. So the theater was there and there's a very robust theater in, in Wilmington and in the surrounding areas. And as a 10-year-old, as a uh, my first big job was in uh, the ensemble of a production of Oliver, where I appeared with also Tony, Tony winner Reed Burney, who was at the mm. time 14, I was 10. So I can say <laughs> I was on stage with a Tony winner. That's Your incredible. Uh, but it was, it was really fun. And there was the opera. We, I was part of the... Uh, the Delaware Opera Company. They had a whole children's division that we toured operas around to schools and different places. So I was really immersed in it from the get-go. Uh, so it really was sort of bred into me, if you will. Absolutely right. And something that, again, you ran with and then you sort of, you know, perfected in your own way, added your own touch and taste to it. Uh, you became, in 96, the contributing theater editor for Gay City News, and you're also the editor of Connecticut Voice. Tell us about that work as a writer. Well, it's been, my background was in theater, and as you said, I went to BU for their theater school. I thought I was going to be an actor or a stage manager. I did not become that, and and I actually, in my double life in the toy industry, I was I was talking to I, I was up for two jobs, one in the toy business, one in the theater. And one of my mentors had said, when you find the thing you love as much as you love this, do that. And I love working with kids and I love toys. And I love education, thanks to my upbringing. And so I chose the toys, but I stayed active, involved in writing about theater and, of course, going. 
And in 96, I was renting space to a, the, a magazine at the time called Lesbian and Gay New York. And I went into the editor and I said, your theater writer's not that good. And she said, well, we can't find anyone to do it for free. And I said, well, I'll do it for free. And she goes, why would I hire you? You're all about toys. So I gave her my, <laughs> right? So I gave her my whole background. I'd been at Arena Stage. I'd been a dramaturg. I'd done some translation from German of Brecht. Um, and she said, okay, we'll try you out. And here we are, what, 20, 20 uh, however many years later, and I'm still being tried out. But, but it's gotten me into the theater. I've written about it. It's just been... It's been a thrill because I am probably the most enthusiastic audience member you'll ever find. <laughs> mm, you're on your feet, ovation, and you, ovation, and yeah, uh, huh? That's and you fantastic. need the audience. <laughs> you need the audience, absolutely. I mentioned, yeah, the, the love of toys and having an opportunity to surround yourself. Here's just one of your <laughs> pieces of work here. I love this. Tell us about this. Uh, that was a book that we did, I think, back in 2015. And what we, what I did was I crowdsourced at the time. Crowdsourcing was relatively new. We went out to hundreds and hundreds of people to say, what are the toys you remember from your childhood? Because remembering those toys, these are elemental parts of our identity. We become yes. who we play, I believe. So these are, this is a collection of the toys that a lot of people remembered, including their, uh, their memories. And, and we've got Mr. Machine behind me over here. Uh, from the 19 from 1960 and it's just uh, it's such an important part of people's lives what they played with and so it was to celebrate that as well so what spurred that interest in toys for you to the part to the point of wanting to really revel in it and write about it and and learn all you could about the world of toys well, even when I came back here, uh, back when I even when I when I was came back to New York uh, as you know as a professional out of college, I was not able to make money being an off off Broadway stage manager. I know mm -hmm. that sounds unbelievable, but I wasn't really able to support myself on nothing. And I my only skill was typing, and I typed for a publishing company. It was owned by CBS. I got promoted into their toys division at the time. And suddenly I was enmeshed in education and educational theory and toys and play. And it was just something that was, uh, was incredible. I still have my Matchbox cars from, uh, from when I was growing up as well. I heard you mention that before. So it's, uh, you know, these things are sort of, I wanted kids to have as creative a childhood as I did, really, is what drove me. That is so fantastic. Do you ever play with those Matchbox cars? Do you ever take them out and... I do. And, you know, they're they're old and some of the tires have decomposed a little bit, but they're, but they're still uh, they're still great. Like I say, we are all just big kids in adult clothing. That's really what it is. Right. Never lose that sense of wonderment. Right. Right. And, and play is really that that question of what if what if I do this? What if what happens? And really following that through. And it's so healthy. Play is so important for development because it fosters the imagination, which fosters critical thinking, which fosters identity, and it's all rolled into one, and it's such an important part of our uh, uh, humanity, really. Do you have an ultimate favorite toy from childhood? Well, I was gonna say my Matchbox cars because they could be almost anything I wanted. I could compete with them, I could bash them together, I could collect them. They really are sort of a wonderful, wonderful toy, and I started traveling with them because my brothers would play with them when I wasn't home and I had to protect them. So they're, they're still in the closet in the other room. Did you uh, step up to Hot Wheels too? <laughs> I did do some Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels were all about speed. And what made Hot Wheels different was that they had that metal axle that made them go so fast. And that's what Elliot Handler wanted when he introduced them in 67. Yes, you are so right. When you were talking, I ran off. Look what I got. Ah, that's amazing. And I got the carrying case. <laughs> wow, yours is in better condition than mine is. Mine, they, mine's, uh, mine's much, uh, much loved. <laughs> there's, ah! two, there's two. I know he wants to reach in and grab them. There's two, <laughs> and there's two layers. You lift up and there's another layer of all these different, I mean, <laughs> and they're still magical for you. That's the thing. That's the thing. Yes. They still make you smile and still make they're you think cool, about right? that. Yeah, you know yeah, what it is? Exactly. I always had a thing 
And it's probably why I always loved the, I really enjoyed when we got the station wagon that sort of was the same design as the uh, Brady Bunch station wagon. Right, right, right. <laughs> the, uh, I always loved the open to Mr. Ro you know, my affiliation with public television all these years. I always loved the magical open to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood because it was a little mini version of sort of real life with the little houses and the right. trolley and, oh, yeah. and all of that. And I always enjoyed childlike miniature versions of adult things. So matchbox cars, hot wheels, train sets, things that were sort of a child's view of the adult world and you can get lost and create your own world through it. So uh, I actually created in the basement when I was a kid we were able to get a huge piece of plywood. This was out east on Long Island in New York and create as close as we could a replica of the Mr. Rogers neighborhood oh, so great. opening <laughs> sequence and closing sequence. Uh, and I already had the matchbox cars to put right. it there. So it was just really cool, you know? <laughs> it's great. And and that's what kids do is they interpret the world in the in the context of their understanding. And yes. it's so expressive for you. And I, I just love, I love that story. <laughs> Isn't that Kathleen in New York in Queens says matchbox cars are cool. <laughs> yes, they are. Kathleen, did you have some too? <laughs> so toys and being so immersed in this wonderful world of toys and theater, how do the two, do the two worlds ever meld or are they totally separate for you? Well, every once in a while they mailed. I mean, there's every once in a while you have a public relations person who works on a toy account and a theater account, and then they get sort of like whip whiplash as they try. Wait, I'm dealing with you on this, and now I'm dealing with you on this. But they really are all about uh, places of imagination, places of suspending your disbelief, places of going into a larger experience outside of just you and becoming part of a, a different world. And I and I think just as theater and as we em learn to empathize and understand stories with theater, just as we begin to express ourselves through play, this is kind of the training ground for being a human being. Yes, it is exactly right. You know, you mentioned Oliver. Do you remember the very first play that you went to in your life? The very first play I went to in my life was a production of, I think, Hansel and Gretel. I was probably three and I do remember having to be taken out because I was terrified. And ah. I remember there was a, a round window in the door and my dad lifted me up so I could look through the, the window at what was going on on stage, but still be safe. I like that. <laughs> the love of a dad. That is so cool. So, you know, we're talking about Terrence McNally, of course, one of the most renowned playwrights and, and folks in theater of all time and still greatly missed and, you know, beloved. And what do you think it is? I mean, I mentioned earlier when I was opening the show that the outpouring of sadness for the loss of this iconic person in the theater world and, and just in, you know, in general in life, he touched so many lives and made a difference in so many lives and still does even though he's not with us through his art through his work what do you think it is about terence mcnally that still resonates with everybody and and why people have this profound connection to him i think it was all about he was always about telling the truth yeah and, but he was always about telling the truth in a loving way and he really loved actors and he loved performance and he loved language. And he was just very generous, even though he was a cranky, but always generous collaborator. He was always trying to make things better, always working further to make it to make each piece better. And in fact, if you read the published versions of some of his plays, they're not the same as they were on stage because he kept working on them. He was always trying to make things better. And, and I think he always wanted the people he worked with to be their best. And in fact, when he told, when I started writing this book, he said, it's your book, you write it the way you want. And, and that was, that's the kind of gift he gave to people. And yet he was always there to be supportive. You know, that's the, would you say he was like a curmudgeon in a way? 
I don't think he was a curmudgeon. Or a I mensch. think he could I, he was definitely a mensch, but he could yeah. he could certainly he was very passionate about the art. And I tell the story of Darko Trezhnak, who who directed Anastasia, uh, who worked with him and Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty and Terrence on on Anastasia. And he he said he was shocked at how the three of them fought at tooth and nail. And then they'd go out to dinner and it'd be, oh, what's going on in your life? What's going on in your life? It was always about the work. And it was the personal side. People could always count on him to show up and to be loving. But the work, he would fight for his work. You know, what you just said is, I hope everybody heard that. Because if we could only take that way of being, you may have a disagreement. You may have a different outlook. You may have a different upbringing, whatever. But you could still agree to disagree and go out to dinner, still have fun, still appreciate the other person, who they are, their respect for the other person, where they're coming from, listen to what they have to say, because maybe there's some nuggets in there that you can apply to your own life and enrich your own life if you're just doing something a certain way. And to be that kind of person, as you're describing Terrence, it's a beautiful thing and it's a great lesson that I think we all need to hear, especially now in our very divided world. Yeah, I agree. And it, for Terrence, it was always about making the show the best it could be. And he would, uh, Lynn Ahrens talks about uh, in Ragtime, how he wrote a scene and put it in an envelope and told her, don't look at this until you go home. And she said, I opened the, I opened the envelope in the cab and I started to cry. And it's the song that became in Ragtime back to before, which is a real turning point in the in the drama. And it's it's just amazing because he was he would just he just gave that. And she said, well, I'm stealing this. He said, please take it. Uh, it was always about the collaboration, especially in the musicals, about making it better and helping everyone to succeed. And that's the key, helping everybody to succeed and encouraging and inspiring others. As much as he was, of course, and we'll talk more about it, uh, epic playwright, he was an, also an actor, a performer himself. Tell us about that side of Terrence. Well, he didn't. He actually didn't do that much acting and performing. He he performed. You know, the line from uh, from uh, "Merrily We Roll Along." I don't perform except at dinner. Uh, he was he was never really wanted. What he learned actually as a young man watching Kukla Fran and Ollie on the television uh, yeah. yes. was that he would prefer, he preferred to be backstage running the puppets and making the puppets say things than actually being out in front and being mm. the puppet himself. So right. he would, he would, he didn't give actors li line readings, which is say it this way. He said, I write the punctuation and the smart actors know how to act the punctuation. So he was, he was not so much a performer as, as a puppet master. I like the way, yeah, I like the way you described that, a puppet master. And, of course, Kukla Fran and Ali, <laughs> who for, could forget them. And Shari Lewis, too, right. with Lamb Chop. Um, really cool stuff. You know, when you think about his uh, his life, which has, a comp, you know, encompassed so much as a playwright, a librettist, screenwriter as well, he was described as the bard of... American theater, one of the greatest contemporary playwrights the theater world has yet produced, the recipient of five Tony Awards and on and on and on, incredible accolades. But it really was the man himself that people gravitated to. And his his way of thinking, like you say, you know, he could be tough. He has certain things he needed to have done, but there was something about him that people just really wanted to work with him. They wanted to be in a part of his works, right? Oh, yeah. And, and it was for a lot of people to, <clears throat> a lot of actors to be able to, to premiere a Terrence McNally piece was really important. The actor, Michael Urey, probably at a, at a tribute, did the last thing that Terrence really wrote that, that he was performed that was written specifically for Michael Urey. And it was about being... He was Pete Buttigieg, uh, playing Pete Buttigieg, and it was in a, an adaptation of his play, Some Men. It was an addition to that. And Michael says the idea of being able to do something that Terrence McNally had written for me was just a profound experience for him. 
And he was originally from Florida, and uh, that's where the resting place uh, ended up being, which is, you know, sort of coming home, which is a really beautiful thing. You know, as well for our audience, his work centered on the difficulties of and urgent need for human connection. And that's something that we are all looking to enhance. And when you have had the luxury of witnessing and appreciating and reveling in his work, in his plays, in his art, you've had an opportunity to understand the importance of human connection, right? Oh, absolutely. And that was actually the whole basis of his very first Broadway play, which was called And Things That Go Bump in the Night. It, it lasted for 16 performances. It would have closed after one after opening, except Paul Libin uh, kept it open with $1 seats and $2 on the weekend. And that was all about connecting the character Clarence, who was the first openly gay character ever to be on the Broadway stage, uh, in a positive way, not seen as a, as a cartoon or a stereotype. He really believed in love and connection. Of course, he's destroyed, but everybody's destroyed uh, for that. But it was really, he has some very moving speeches about the need for connection, and I still believe in love. And that was something that's echoed throughout of all of Terrence's work, whether it's, it's that play or fast forward to Dead Man Walking, where sister Helen Prejean has to connect with the, with the uh, protagonist who is in jail for, for murder. In addition to that, too, also, he has had this very unique position where he's one of the few playwrights of his generation to have successfully passed from the avant-garde to mainstream acclaim, right? Absolutely true. When he came, he came to New York in 1956 to go to Columbia, and that was the time when the off-off Broadway movement was really percolating. Right? There was UNESCO and Genet and and Charles yeah. Dinsenzio and Robert Patrick and a lot of these these playwrights. Some people may know, but but who were really creating this this movement in response to what they saw as the the staid commercialism of the Broadway theater. So he actually just jumped in and started writing in that vein. And in fact, Things That Go Bump in the Night is kind of in that absurdist vein. But he evolved and he started to write things like Next, which is a one act play about uh, the Vietnam War. And he started to become more literal, more dramatic. He never thought of himself as a naturalistic writer, but as po a poetic realist is, is the term he used because he knew that the theater is an abstraction. And when you put something on the stage, it's, it's not real, but you can have real feelings associated with that. For a brief time, he lived in Hollywood, right? And, and you know, took a shot there, but uh, the East Coast, New York brought him back. Yeah, he thought that he was going to become a TV writer and he was gonna live in Malibu. He did buy a house in Malibu that he kept for five years, but that he was gonna live in Malibu and be a TV writer. But he really wasn't suited for that. The show he wrote was called Mama Maloney, and it, he co-produced it with Norman Lear, who at the time- That was on was, CBS in the 80s. Yes, it yes. was on CBS for, for, for yes. I think, for all, all 13 uh, episodes that they did. And they put it up against Monday Night Football, which is like death. That and killed as everything, said, yeah. Yes. You know, when, they, when they did the ratings of 1 to 50, it started at 49 and it ended at 49. And it just never caught on partially because Terrence's style was not the TV sitcom style. It was very somewhat abstract and a little bit, little bit absurdist and, and not, it was not I Love Lucy or the mothers-in-law or anything very conventional or even familiar. The mothers-in-law, the Desi Lu, uh, <laughs> Desi Arnaz production. Yes, Kay Ballard and uh, Eve, Eve Arden. Eve Arden. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. I was this close to meeting Kay Ballard. I hoped that I could. And there was a, we were trying to get our great friend, Dan Goggin, of course, from oh, Nonsense. Yeah. Nonsense. He's a dear, yeah. dear friend. And uh, he was trying to get us together. And, but she had passed. It was, she had already Aww. just passed. But what a hoot. And her and Eve together and mothers in law. <laughs> you don't hear as much about that series. Um, because I don't think it ran as long. So maybe right. as far as the syndication, uh, but yeah, that, that was a good one. <laughs>
You know, one that I always talk about too is family. Do you remember family with um, oh, Sadie yeah. Thompson and James yeah. Broderick uh, on ABC? That was an Aaron Spelling production, I believe. Right. One of his right. favorites. Uh, that was a really, really good, you know, television writing. Then it was exceptional in a series like that, you know? Right, right. So how many Terrence McNally productions have you seen? Oh my gosh. You know what? I, I've not been asked that question before. I, I, a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've been over the, over the years, I, I did not, I'm slightly too young to have seen uh, uh, things that go bump in the night, but, but a lot of the stuff I remember when I first came to New York, there were next was still playing in different places. And then of course I was here and lips together, teeth apart, Lisbon Traviata, all of some of the early ones came along uh, that, that, people got to see and a lot of the stuff at Manhattan Theater Club, which was really uh, his home for so many years. They premiered 14 plays of his over 15 years. So, so it was always, as Lynn Meadows said, I always just said, the next Terrence McNally play, whatever it is, she wrote yeah. on her yellow pad as she was planning the season. So I've, see, I've seen a lot of them and, I, and I've actually seen a lot of the revivals. I saw the original Frankie and Johnny with... Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> with uh, oh my god, I'm losing my mind. Kathy Bates, with oh, Kathy yes. Bates, yes, uh, who is the funniest interview on the planet. But yeah. but Kathy Bates in was in that and saw all of those revivals: Stanley Tucci, Edie Falco, and then most recently with Audrey McDonald. That's incredible. What is it you think about um, Terrence that drew you to want to sort of? document his life, celebrate his life. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this episode of our show, you worked with Terrence on this, or he gave you the blessing to create this masterpiece, this book about his life. Um, what was that process like? Well, it was, it was actually pretty funny. Uh, I was inter interviewing him in, in 2014 because he had a play in preparation that became Mothers and Sons with Tyne Daly and, and uh, Bobby Steggert and Fred Weller. And it was, it was the continuation of Andre's Mother, which he had written for uh, Manhattan Theater Club years and years ago. And we were sitting, I was sitting in his living room. You've seen pictures of his living room there. And I, he, he, said, uh, he said, well, I've decided I'm not going to write an autobiography. And I said, oh, why not? He said, no, I just, I just don't want to. And impulsively, I said, well, can I write the book? And he said, sure. <laughs> and that was that. And I was kind of off to the races with that. Um, took a while to find a publisher. He was, he was really eager. And, and one of the things that, that I think he, was a, he liked was I, I said to him, well, I'm not Kitty Kelly. I wasn't wow. really interested in any gotcha. of the, the darker wow. gossipy stuff. Uh, I was really interested in how this man who created plays that had such a personal resonance to so many people on stage and off. How, how did he get there? I was really fascinated by that. What are some of the things, you, we don't want to give the whole book away because we want people to get the book, but what are a few of those nuggets about how he got there that you learned that might have even surprised you? Well, I, I, there's a couple of them. When he was he, Later on, as he looked back at and things that go bump in the night, he said, I was really trying to imitate Edward Albee who he'd been in a relationship with for, for a long time. And it was while he was finding his, his own way. I think when it came to things like writing about, about the Vietnam War, it was how can you not write about it? And that's uh, next and Cuba C and bringing it all back home, a lot of his short plays. And then when the AIDS crisis came, he was really, he said, how can I not write about this? How can I not write about my community? And he cared so deeply about his community and he cared so deeply about relationships. But the one thing he said I, that drove him was he wanted to be heard. He had stuff to say, and he really wanted to be heard. And that was the thing that really propelled him as each thing happened in his life, as each thing happened in the culture, as each thing happened in the theater. He really wanted to be heard. And he was unafraid to take on new genres. You know, it's amazing, too. When you look at his body of work, uh, he rarely rested, rarely took time off. I mean, play after play, production after production, bang, 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 one right after the other, which is extraordinary, huh? Oh, absolutely. And, and 
from all that you see, and I, I think there's like 37 completed scripts or whatever, it's all, there's a whole uh, uh, listing of, of his work in the back of the book. But in addition to that, in his archives, which are at the University of Texas in Austin, there are half done scenes, there's ideas, there's lists of play titles, there's all kinds of stuff in there. He was working nonstop and always looking for what's the next thing, what's going to pique my interest. You know, Andre's mother, I believe uh, the one from 1990, because he did The Last Mile, Common Ground, Mama Maloney, Andre's mother in 1990. I believe that's the one that Seda Thompson played the mother, right? She did uh, in, the, yes. in, the, in the PBS version of that, yes. which is the, the expanded one. The original play is was three pages or... long. Yeah, 88, it's three pages long. It's a monologue and yeah. Andre's mother doesn't speak. Right. But he expanded on that uh, for for the PBS thing, which I think is quite marvelous, actually, with Richard Tom with Richard Thomas. Yeah, it was if you were used to seeing uh, Seda Thompson and many other, she was one of the great, I think, underrated actresses. And when you saw her, you know, in other things, Our Town, and of course playing Kate Lawrence and Family, the loving mother, Home and Hearth, Matriarch, and then seeing her as Andre's mother. The uh, it just really showcased her extraordinary versatility as an actress because the way she took that role on, you almost disliked her in certain ways, then sort of to come around to like her. And you, if you have the Kate Lawrence character in your mind, erase it <laughs> before you <laughs> see that because you know what I mean, she's not going to be in the kitchen coming out with biscuits like she did on family. She, uh, she is not. And, and I think actually before that, she had done uh, Paul Zindel's play, The Effect of Gamma Rays on Man in the Moon Marigolds. That's and right. that is not a nice woman. Beatrice is not a nice woman. <laughs> no, not at all. But again, you know, working, we're talking about iconic talent in all of these film too. The Ritz in 1976. All right. And that was because Terrence wanted to write a farce. He wanted, he just thought, well, I, I'm interested in, in farce, in a fado farce. It's the only farce he wrote. And it's set in a gay bathhouse. And it's supposed to be the continental baths or the metropolitan baths. I, I, I sorted it all out because there were a lot of baths in, in New York at the time. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's the one where the entertainment was, where, of course, Bette Midler got her start with Barry Manilow. And yes. it really is just this door slamming farce set on three levels of a gay bathhouse. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, people might not remember that one, but go check that out. Frankie and Johnny, of course, in 91. Right. Uh, that was that was the, the way Frankie and Johnny came around is a great story because Lynn Meadow backstage at uh, It's Only a Play when it was first debuting in at Manhattan Theater Club uh, said to Terrence, I'll do your next play, whatever it is. So Terrence came in a couple of weeks later and said, I want to do this period drama, which is an adaptation of Shakespeare. And it's got, and Lynn Meadows sitting there going, oh my goodness, I'm never going to be able to afford this. And she goes, okay. He comes back in with this two-hander, which is Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune. And it became a huge hit for them. Uh, started in stage two, which is a smaller one, and then moved to stage one. And, and Kathy Bates was just phenomenal in that. Absolutely. Knocked it out of the park. Uh, really extraordinary. And Love, Valor, Compassion in 97, another film of Terrence's. Yeah. Yeah, that was a film. It was based on a play that was also done at Manhattan Theater Club. And it, it's eight gay men over three weekends. Terrence loved the three act format over over three weekends in a house in upstate New York. And several of the characters are dying of age. John Glover ultimately won a Tony Award for playing the twins, John and James Jekyll. Nathan Lane was in that. And there's some really funny stories about that in the book. But it was a real, um, it, was, it was very touching because it really was, it came out at a time when, when AIDS was really, HIV AIDS was really a death, death sentence for people. So it was very difficult for them to, uh, for these characters to wrestle with that. Why am I living? Why am I dying? What are we about? And it really is, it's one of his most heartfelt pieces. And in 95, won Best Play, won the Tony Award for that. And also Kiss of the Spider Woman and, of course, Masterclass and Ragtime. 
Um, Masterclass was another back in 96. That was extraordinary too, huh? Uh, absolutely. Now you asked me what was surprising about, about Terrence was he, he told me that Masterclass was his most autobiographical play. And, as I, and I was like, whoa. And, and as I dug into it, I, was, I, I found out he said that quite often. Uh, he loved his stories that he could repeat. But it's really, it really is autobiographical if you look at it, because it's about the story of how an artist becomes themselves, how an artist defines themselves in the context of their art. And Maria Callas is just a, a larger-than-life character. And I had the yes. privilege of seeing Zoe Caldwell and Patti Lapone and Dixie Carter and Tyne Daly all play that role. And they each made it their own. And one other funny thing about Masterclass was that when you go through his archives, it's one of his most produced plays, and there are letters and programs from actresses from all over the world saying what it meant to them to embody Maria Callas in that play. And you just you just want to weep as you read these heartfelt letters of, of these people whose lives were changed by, by Terrence's art. What was that like for you reading those letters? It was it was incredible. I was I was in this wonderful room at the UT in their in their Harry Ransom Center, and they're bringing me boxes down, and you have to be very careful with the paper and all that stuff. But I would read that, and the the love of these people would just pour off these handwritten notes, and Terrence kept them all, and that's why they were in the archives. That's incredible, huh? Yeah. So I mentioned in the introduction too that you had this wonderful opportunity to interview so many fabulous people. Uh, when this was, now, how did that happen? Was it where you just approached the people? Did he give you a list of people that he would like to see in the book? Uh, did he sort of maybe make the intros for you, set the stage? Uh, he, God bless him, because he said, oh, I want you to talk to so-and-so, and I want you to talk to so-and-so. He gave me their contacts. He gave me, in some cases, their personal emails uh to to reach out to them and then he called a lot of these people so they were wow. waiting for me to call and i found out i found out later that they would do the interview and then to call terrence and say did i do okay did i do okay uh, and it was it was just <laughs> i mean for me to talk to people who i've idolized for years like christine baranski and nathan oh, lane yeah. and john glover uh, was, was amazing. I have a good friend and I would call her up and go, oh my God, I'm going to talk to Christine yeah. Baranski. <laughs> so then I could get on and say, well, good afternoon, Miss Baranski. <laughs> it was really completely, uh, I tried not to go totally fanboy on these people, but they were amazingly generous and, and told a lot of great stories. I met Christine at a uh, PBS gala event and she couldn't be nothing more than warm and engaging and quick-witted, funny, and very affable. She's fantastic, isn't she? She is fantastic. And incredibly, with, with Lips Together, Teeth Apart, when Terrence wrote it, he originally wrote the, the role that Christine ultimately played for Stockard Channing. Stockard Channing couldn't do it. And Lynn Meadows said to Terrence, well, I have this actress I want you to meet who had done stuff with MTC. And apparently... Well, both Terrence and Christine said they clicked immediately and they just got each other right from the get-go. Which is fantastic when that happens. Tell yeah. us about some of the other folks that you had the real pleasure. I mean, it would probably talk about being a kid in a toy store writing about <laughs> right? toys. This was probably like being a kid in a candy store with all of this great talent that you had an opportunity to just sit down and chat with for the book. My, one of my favorites was Kathy Bates, and she was one of the only people who said, do not record this call. So I was typing furiously as, as, she, as she talked to me. I hope and you didn't interview her at a motel. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. Um, and she, she was a riot because she told me about Frankie and Johnny and that and it, it's a great story because she said I, you know, Terrence acknowledged her as a woman, as a sexual woman. And that changed her whole perception of herself. But then she talked about being backstage and standing stark naked because the play begins with Frankie and Johnny in bed having sex, start standing across the stage, looking across the stage at an understudy she'd never met and that they were going to just sort of jump in bed and pretend to have sex. <laughs> uh, and she just, she just went for it. And Pam Singer, who was, the, uh, who was the stage manager on that, told me, 
Kathy Bates is the most fearless actress she's ever worked with. When she's told dive right in, she <laughs> dives right in. <laughs> Literally. Uh, that's so cool. Who else? Tell us about some of the other incredible folks that people will be able to hear from in the book. Well, Christine Baranski, of course, was, was yeah. lovely. And, and she tells the story about, about Lips Together, Teeth Apart, and it was written. And Terrence, you have to know, overwrote. So the, the first draft of, of uh, Lips Together, Teeth Apart would have been about three and a half hours long. It had all of this horrible language in it, which I, which I won't repeat on a, in a family TV show. Uh, <laughs> but, but Christine said, I read the script and I thought, I'm just a girl from Buffalo. I can't have my mother hear me <laughs> say <laughs> these things. Uh, but, but, you know, ultimately, ultimately Terrence and the, and the company really worked it together. And there's not a lot of vulgarity in that, in that play. And yet the, the, the passion and the emotion underneath it, you don't need the vulgarity because it's so present and so real. And, and what Christine made that, the, the vulnerability of that character so, so moving. Nobody's been able to match her in that. No, that's so incredible. We're showing people here how they can get the book. It is on Amazon, folks. Is there also, I believe, a Kindle as well? I think there's a Kindle, Kindle yeah. And yeah. How about audio uh, book? Uh, oh, no, there's not. But my editor said, if you want to record it, go ahead. So I, I'm, I'm probably going to set aside some time and do it, read it. A lot everybody. of people, yeah. I, I, it's amazing when I talk to so many different people, other people that want to get the material, they always ask about the audio books. I guess they just, you know, in their car while they're driving or when they're on a train or whatever, just listen to it and sort right. of get lost in it. It's a, it's a newer thing that people seem to have a real craving for, huh? It, it is. I, I had never done uh, an audio book before, but I, I listened to Kelly Ripa's book on, on audio and it was an incredible experience. And, and I've been on this show for many years doing toys with them, but uh, she, 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 we shared the, the uh, uh, vicissitudes of coming up with a book, but listening to her do it was like, oh, that was inspiring. No, we can't let you get away with just that. You were on the show many years. Tell us about that with Kelly. So I've, I've, I've actually done that show for many Absolutely. years doing crazy things. And, and since Kelly's been on, we do insane stuff. If you look up Kelly Ripa gets slimed on YouTube, you can see part of the, part of the fun that and, we've had. And this is on live on ABC. Uh, yeah, on live. You, as far back as Regis. As far back, I was on Regis yeah. and, and Kathy Lee yeah. <laughs> years oh, ago. So. I loved but, when they were together. They, there was a real chemistry when Regis, uh, Regis was a dear friend and I miss him. And he was a fantastic person and just, you know, I saved the network and I'm an only one man and everything. <laughs> and uh, he he opened up the door for a lot of people, of course, starting on he, the Joey Bishop show and oh, all. he did. But do you remember the very first incarnation of... You might you might have been in Delaware, unless you were in the New York area. It was the morning show, and it was Regis Philbin and Kathy Garver. No, not Kathy Garver. It was Cindy Garver. It was the oh, right. ball player, Kindy, uh, right. Kathy Garver. She was a guest on our show. She was sissy on Family Affair. Right. But Cindy Garver, Garvey, Garvey, Garvey. Cindy Garvey, Steve Garvey, the ball player's wife. They were the original hosts of that show on WABC Channel 7. Right. It was and, local. And then yeah. when she moved on, Ann Abernathy came in for a short while. And then they saw uh, Kathy Lee Johnson, who used to do Name That Tune, remember? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think Tom Kennedy, one of them, hosted that. And then she was on Good Morning America, and they brought her in, and the two of them. I just love the ribbing. And then when she was off and Joy, his wife, came in, it was fantastic the way yeah. she would keep him in line. Oh, oh Regis. They offered her the role to co-host when Kathy Lee was leaving, but she, she didn't want to take it. Joy didn't want to take it. Right. It would have been cool to see that play out. So you've been doing it on live for a while, huh? That's a yeah. Yeah. great yeah. show with longevity. <laughs> last, uh, last holiday was my 26th holiday. Uh, making a fool of myself and playing with toys on there. But uh, so but does are... art call you or does uh, Gelman call you directly? <laughs> uh, no, I would say I have a wonderful producer, Jan, who calls me and, and they are, they're just wonderful. And, and art more is the 
sweetest person on the planet. I love him. <laughs> he is he's just great. <laughs> yes, yes. One of the founders of that show. And he used to be with uh, maybe, I think it was KYW in Philadelphia yeah. before he went yep. up to ABC. And, uh, you know, a prolific uh, producer, kind of like Bill Getty, who we just lost, who created The oh, View right. with Barbara yeah. Walters. Yeah. You know, these iconic people that create these um, amazing shows, you know talking with my TV hat on. We uh, we dug this up. This is, of course, a younger Terrence. Yeah. What a great shot, huh? That is. That's about that. It's it's not, we don't really know the date of it, but it's probably around, you know, 1959, 1960, when he was, when he was at Columbia. And it's just a, a wonderful shot. And that's about the time he met Edward Albee, who said he was the most beautiful boy he'd ever seen. And, and uh, yeah, he was quite, quite handsome as a young man. Look at this shot. That's with Elaine May. And that's uh, about when they were working with on Next. And that was, uh, that was the one that said he, he got to quit his day job after he yeah. got to do Next at the Berkshire Theater Festival. Yeah. And that really propelled his career. Absolutely. And of course, this is terrific. Lynn and uh, Terrence and Steven. Yeah, uh, Stephen Flaherty and Lynn Ahrens, and and they worked on a bunch of things together. I mean, they did they did Ragtime together. They did A Man of No Importance, which I referenced with the title. Yes, and they they did Anastasia, and and Terrence has said, "I'm never doing another musical again. <laughs> never doing another musical again." And and Lynn called him one day and said, "Well, would you like to do this?" And you were... <laughs> and, and Terrence did it because he loved Russian history and he loved uh, Lynn and Stephen. So. So he was in because uh, he knew it would be a great ride. Mm, absolutely. Look at this one, too. Lips, the cast together. That's, that's the original cast of, of Lips Together, Teeth Apart, Nathan Lane, Swoozy Kurt Standing, Christine Baranski, Anthony Held. Uh, that's Terrence down in the front. And John Tillinger off to, to what, what would be on your left, uh, the director. Look at this amazing shot we dug up. <laughs> Zoe Caldwell, Terrence. Angela Lansbury and Barbara Cook and Terrence and Angela Lansbury had the most amazing friendship. Uh, they just, she did his play Deuce and uh, with, uh, with um, uh, Marion Seldes, but, but they were close friends throughout their lot, throughout the, since they met actually. <laughs> Look at that, huh? Including Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers and Cheetah Rivera. And that would yeah. have been around the time of Kiss of the Spider Woman uh, or the rink. I'm not sure which one, but, but Cheeto. Cheetah was the uh, the go-to star for them. Which was, again, another extraordinary Tony-winning play. This is a great shot, too. Uh, that's uh, Cheetah with John Kander and Fred Ebb and Terrence. And that would have been either either at the rink or or Kiss of the... Uh, not would not have been Kiss of the Five. Um, it would have probably been around the time of the rink. You know, this is something very special with Terrence, this shot. Yeah, he was he was given a, an honorary degree at Colum from Columbia, and and he graduated from Columbia. He he loved his time at Columbia. He thought it, how he ended up there was on a coin toss. He and his best friend were accepted to Columbia and Yale from from Corpus Christi, and they didn't think it made sense for two best friends to go to the same school and maybe room together. So they flipped a coin, and that's how Terrence ended up at Columbia. And then, of course, years <laughs> later, he he got an honor honorary degree there. Which is absolutely amazing. And we've got uh, an earlier shot of him here, too. And then, of course, a more recent. That's a cool. Right. Then and, then and now, huh? Oh, absolutely. And and he was really. Uh, but you know what? I, when you show me those, you can see the eyes. The eyes yes. never change. He, he had such kind eyes. And he was always he always they always when you sat with him, they always twinkled because he was always interested. And and we would talk about his life, but he always wanted to know. What have you seen? What do you like? Who's this? Who's who's bad? What do you hear about this play? What do you hear about that play? So he was actively engaged all the time and, and really interested. Exactly right. Here's a time that we dug up when his eyes were really twinkling. Uh, <laughs> that is, Terrence was invited to go to India and it was as part of a promotion of tourism for India. And he went and he loved India, and here he is with a with a big snake. I don't know what kind of snake it is, big. Uh, and he came back and he wrote a perfect Ganesh out of being in India. If you know a perfect Ganesh, it is it's a tragedy, but it's actually a beautiful, beautiful play. 
not really an advertisement for tourism to India, but it was really, it really inspired him to be on a more spiritual journey, which he took for the rest of his life. Which is really incredible. And you can see the pure joy yeah. you know, that he has uh, as he entrusts them with, <laughs> with the snake, uh, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is really incredible. And then, of course, the wonderful oh. duo here with Tom. Yeah, yeah, that, that's his husband, Tom. And, and Terrence had a lot of, a lot of relationships in the, in, over the course of his life, starting with Edward Albee and we, we talk a little bit about them in the book, but it was really Tom. And he said, I never believed in love at first sight until I met Tom. But really, they're being able to travel the road through marriage equality and getting married and really, really sharing a life and, and really living openly as a married couple. That was something that Terrence in 1960 never would have believed was possible. And he said to me often, he said, my favorite sentence is, the reservations are in my husband's name. And he just loved that. He loved being married to Tom. And Tom, who hails from Hop Hog, Long Island, New York, is also, for those watching who are unsure, very prolific uh, and very deeply involved in, in the arts and theater world as well and entertainment. Yeah, he had started his career as an AIDS lawyer, uh, fighting to get coverage for people who didn't have insurance and being able to help get medical care. He met Terrence. He was still doing that. And he basically became an intern for some of the producers. And he loved, he loved, found he loved producing. He'd always loved theater, but then he kept producing. And now Tom Curtihay Productions, it's a big deal. They just had uh, uh, Hades Town and New York, New York and Grey House and the revival of Little Shop of Horrors and the revival. He participated in the revival of A Man of no importance at CSC. So he's really a very creative and beloved producer, which isn't an easy thing to always say. And to have those combined in the same sentence. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I mean, right? Yeah. Love producer isn't always, a, it doesn't always go together. Love the name of the book. And again, congratulations on it, Christopher. Um, how did you come up with the name? I think I know, but for our well, audience. Well, his, yeah. <laughs> his musical, A Man of No Importance, is one of my very favorite works of his because it's so creative and how he interpreted that movie into a musical uh, with, with Aaron's and Flaherty. But it really is, it's kind of like Terrence, for all his being out there, was, was personally very modest. So it sounded modest. It was a reference to the, to the musical, which is a reference to Oscar Wilde. Uh, and it was also just, I don't know, it just seemed appropriate. It's terrific. It really is. And congratulations on it. When did you actually start writing it? And what was the hardest part? Is it, was it getting the first few words on paper? Was it knowing when to finish it and to cap it off and be comfortable enough to say, okay, that's it. That's the last word. That's the period on that sentence. We're good. I'm done with it. Or, which is, you'll probably appreciate this as a, as a writer and an author, one time I had, or a couple of times now, I've had a guest that has said, actually, the beginning wasn't hard for me. Knowing when to end wasn't hard. It was bridging the beginning with the ending and having the middle uh, and sort of bridging those two worlds together. How about for you? That's exactly my process. I, I, I knew I wanted to start talking about how I had first encountered a play of his, uh, Things That Go Bump in the Night, when I was 14 years old and what that meant to me. And I knew I wanted to end it talking about the legacy that he left with, the, with all the playwrights and the actors and all of the people who, who feel so profoundly influenced by his work. It was trying to figure out how to talk about what he had done during his life. And I ultimately decided, I, there's so many interconnected timelines that I really needed to talk about it in terms of the plays, the musicals, the opera, and then the operas, and then how he managed personally. And, and that sort of gave me an organization. So it's not really a, and then I, and then I, and then I kind of linear biography. It's more about how did my theater develop? How did my musicals develop? Uh, and incidentally, there wasn't a musical that he didn't threaten to quit, except for Anastasia. And uh, yeah. uh, and and the opera, which is which is you know was a passion of his. So I would imagine Tom loves it, right? And others that are in 
Terence's family and life and friends and peers love this loving tribute to this iconic figure, huh? The feedback. I hope so. I, I haven't heard from it yet. I know that I know that Tom's other passion is tennis. So he's been over at Wimbledon. So I don't oh, know if he's yes. had a chance to read it. And yet. <laughs> Newport, Rhode Island, where we right? were just yeah. last week, they have their big you know championship there. So right, because this just came out days ago. Yeah, this it is, was it, yeah, it did. <laughs> this is like so how does it feel for you, you know, taking the time to do all the research and celebrate this fabulous figure, but at the same time, now here's the physical book. It's out there, it's available. Ah, uh, yeah. How, is it what is it like for you actually with the book done? Well, I think it's it, it, Terrence's story is so inspiring, and and I hope for young people interested in theater, and I hope for anybody uh, it, that they that they get to be as inspired as as I was, and that 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 that's now possible. I mean, I when I first held the book in my hand, it's not the first book I've written, but when I first held the book in my hand, I go, oh my goodness, it's actually real. And when I'm sitting in my apartment and I'm whacking away at the at the keyboard and I'm going in Austin digging through papers and you know eating takeout and trying to get more time with that <laughs> it doesn't seem it seems a little bit surreal and then uh, when it actually all comes together that that was pretty magical I, I imagine that's what somebody feels like when the curtain goes up on opening night of something that they've worked on forever hmm. is there a specific uh, reader that you had in mind or is it really for anybody well, I think it's absolutely for anybody who's interested in the theater and interested in the process and interested in the certainly how the theater evolved from really 1960 when Terrence started producing his own work to to present a little earlier. Um, and I think that it's but it's also, I think, for that for the young person who feels that they have something to say and that they are willing to follow in Terrence's footsteps, no matter what they threw at Terrence. He just kept going. And I think that's the, the message I would love a young person reading this to say to take away. If I have something to say, no, nobody's going to stop me from saying it. What are some things additionally that you learned along the way that surprised you? Of course, like you're saying, since the 60s, the theater world and just the way the whole process is, has changed dramatically. What are some nuggets that you've learned in doing the research for the book? Well, I think one of the things that, that Terrence, as I think I mentioned earlier, loved the three act format, but he had to confront the fact that at the end of the day, you know, people now want to go 90 minutes, no intermission or you know, yeah. two acts in under two hours. So for him to actually have to refine his writing and keep editing it down to make it fit the world he wants to be heard in, I thought that that was wonderful. I also thought how he would hear specific actors in his head when he was writing. He would write for specific actors and he, he would hear them. And, and I think that that was something that I, I think is great for any anybody who's writing is to hear the voice of the person who's actually speaking the words because that's how we read it. We hear it when we're reading. You know, it's nice to see this recent resurgence for Broadway uh, since the there's just this love and there's all these shows that are coming out and, and this theaters are are full again and and that's really really nice to see huh absolutely and, and i think there's there's some wonderful shows out there to, to see as well and i think that what terrence would love would have been that people are going and he always said go as much as you can buy the most expensive closest seats you can afford because what you're going to see on that night is never going to happen again and that's why he was such a believer in in live theater that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, it's a savor the moment because it is something special and it's it's fleeting and you never know how long something's going to to last. Right. You, you know, having seen so many of the productions, um, what is your favorite? Oh, that's a hard question. Yeah. I, I would definitely top say five. <laughs> of, of the, well, of, uh, of the musicals, it's it's definitely a man of no importance because I think just musically and poetically, it's so beautiful. And, and what Terrence added to that from the movie was the character of Oscar Wilde, which gave Alfie Byrne, who is the protagonist, a bus driver who is gay and who is outed, uh, a, a chance to, to have a, a dialogue with himself through, through Oscar Wilde. I think it's such a beautiful, beautiful show and the score is magnificent. 
I, I actually probably think that it's it's hard to know, but but Masterclass is up there for me because it's just so it's such a pure uh, expression of what an artist goes through. But but also Mothers and Sons, which was a takeoff on Andre's mother and how that came about was I believe Tom and Terrence were having dinner with Tyne Daly and said, would you want to do Andre's mother? And she said, I'm not interested in doing Andre's mother, but I'm interested in what happened to her 25 years later. And that was the genesis of Mothers and Sons. And that was just so spectacular because it was so much of its time. I thought that was, that was really beautiful. And then the opera is Dead Man Walking. I've, I've listened to it obsessively. It's so beautiful. Jake Heggie's score is uh, is awesome, and the Met is doing it this year. It, the the Eva von Hova production was postponed, but it's That's actually funny. happening this year. It's it's what they're opening the Met season with on September twenty sixth. That's going to be something, huh? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's going to be extra special. Get your tickets now, everybody. Right, right. Uh, he also there also is which we do want to mention, and I, I'm very I'm very very happy to mention this. The foundation, the Terrence McNally Foundation, and there's the Terrence McNally Foundation dot org. From your knowledge of it, tell us about the foundation that they have. Well, it's basically to support the theater. I mean, that to keep the live theater going, and they've given, they've worked with the with the Philadelphia Theater Company. There's a Terrence McNally Award that that James I James won, who wrote Fat Ham, that was at the Public Theater and then on Broadway, and it's really about supporting supporting the theater. Isn't that a beautiful thing to have that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it really is important. And it's part of his legacy. And, and that's the, the thing. We have playwrights like Matthew Lopez, who wrote The Inheritance, who points to Terrence's impact on, on his life as, as helping him to become the playwright, the Tony Award winning playwright that he became. Uh, and, and I think that that continues that, even though Terrence has left us, it continues yeah. his influence on the next generation. And I think that's the thing that made him the happiest. What were you left with when you were finishing the book? Uh, you know, when you're writing a book, especially celebrating somebody else's life, you can get very emotionally wrapped up in their story and who they are and making sure that you tell the story in a certain way with, with care and, and understanding and a certain tenderness. I know this from uh, hosting and producing documentaries that there are times where I have placed, just mentioned this to somebody the other day, there was a guest, this self-imposed burden to not only get the story right, but to somehow create this feeling, this warmth, this emotional connection to the person that we are showcasing, remembering, celebrating, um, not just have it be facts and okay, I've read the book next, but be left with a depth that carries on after watching the documentary, reading a book, watching a film, whatever it may be. Was that some of your approach? Did you hope that we had this deeper appreciation for who this person was as a person, as much as an artist? Uh, completely. That was that, and it, it's funny that you say about the emotional stuff because I, one of the things that took me most by surprise is when I finally wrote the part about about his passing, I started crying. I didn't expect to. I thought, you know, I'm I'm a sophisticated, you know, writer. I know how to write and you know, do it. I was I was so I was very emotional uh, at that at that point because it really was. You've, I felt the loss all over again, and that was that was really uh, a surprising and actually kind of wonderful moment. That because there is this level of grief that this voice is silenced, even though his work lives on. So definitely, I wanted to convey that, and I wanted to convey how emotional so much of it was because it really did start from emotion. He was not he was not like Tom Stoppard or. Uh, or, or Bernard Shaw, or people who were really intellectual uh, playwrights. He was a visceral human playwright who wrote about things that were critically important to people, even when they were abstracted or expanded and, and kind of unreal. He really went for that heart. And I, I think that that's the thing that most people related to.
I think what what you, what you just had on the screen was the was from the last speech of Masterclass, and the world can and will go on. Yeah, can and will go on without us. But I have to think that we have made this world a better place, that we have left it richer, wiser than had we not done it. I mean, it's just it's just beautiful. So absolutely, yeah. We're letting people read that, and it it's that is beautiful, and we wanted to to show that because it just really sort of sums some of it up. But, you know, in celebrating somebody who's left us not only with this body of incredible work, but also with an understanding of the human condition and appreciation for the human condition and how we treat each other and how we think about life and how we conduct, you know, ourselves and uh, love and respect and, and all of these things that are so interwoven in his work. It's, Pretty extraordinary stuff, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And we've been, we're so lucky that we get to, that it lives on for us. Absolutely, yeah. Are you uh, working on other material? I don't doubt, uh, Mr. Byrne. <laughs> always, always. We're getting ready for, we're getting ready for the toy season, but also looking at, you know, everybody, right. everybody I interviewed deserves a book of their own. I'm not sure I'll get to all of them, but, <laughs> but, but it yeah. was, it was what a privilege to do. You know, the toy season, you're right. It's about six months ahead, right? Yeah, you got to right. get everything yeah. going. And then, <laughs> well, congratulations on, like I said, this, this masterpiece. I know it was absolutely a labor of love for you. Terrence, I'm sure, would be very, very proud. And I'm sure when Tom reads it, I'm sure he'll be contacting <laughs> you saying, I absolutely love it. You've captured him. And uh, and everybody else, and it is available at Amazon, folks. And there is a Kindle as well. And look for a possible audio book. And uh, coming to us from the heart and soul of our very special guest, uh, renowned writer and author and theater critic, Christopher Byrne. Christopher, this was really uh, terrific. Your first time on the Jim Masters Show live series, but hopefully not the last. We're going to keep the porch light on for you. And you, oh, are thank you. Welcome back anytime spread the word about our show as we mentioned it's warm and conversational engaging we've had a lot of folks that have been commenting throughout the show as well kathleen here says thank you for being here christopher great conversation and good luck with everything and that's kind of you to say that and everybody else that's been commenting and who will also watch this later in the archives because we're going to archive it on our youtube channel jim masters tv merlin's watching in ontario canada Thank Christopher for being here with us. You're in Lovity now. Hey, you're a Gym Master Show <laughs> awesome. Lovity, huh? Isn't awesome. that great? High five. Do I, do I get a pin or something? Well, <laughs> high five on it. There we go. Do the high five. Boom. <laughs> well, I say Marvelous. there's, I, I say to the guests, I say there's Grammys, Academy Awards, there's Tonys, there's Tellies, there's Peabody's, there's Emmys, there's all these great awards, but when you're told you're a Lovity on the Gym Master Show Live, I mean, how does it make you feel, Christopher? Uh, I'm thrilled. I, I feel like I've found a family. That's wonderful. You have found a family. Some of the guests say that their feet start tingling. And then some of the guests, one of the guests said he started levitating as a result. <laughs> well, I, I think my feet are neuropathy, but, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Any carpal tunnel syndrome from doing right, all no, the- Right, uh, not yet. There's the link again to get the extraordinary book, folks, at Amazon. That's, I mean, the exact link. But if you go to Amazon.com and you type in the title or just type in Christopher Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E, of course, you will, uh, you'll get right to it and, and other material of his as well. So this is cool. I'm coming over with my Matchbox cars and we're going to have some Yes! <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I look forward to it. Chris, I, I really appreciate this and hope you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you. What a pleasure. What a, what a pleasure. It, it, you know, there's been so much warmth around this book. I just feel like embraced by all of it and, and this show especially. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine, as my father has always said and told us since we were seven years old. Jim, whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, ask them too. please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> You be well, my friend. Again, congratulations on the book. We'll let the viewers know again how they can get a copy. And uh, don't be a stranger. Spread the word about our show to other folks you think would like to pop on. And you're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much. All right. You take care. Congratulations on Thank all. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.
Christopher Byrne joining us live from New York City, burning the midnight oil and those candles, writing all this great material for all of us to enjoy. Let's show you the book again. If you joined us late, don't fret, because you know how it works here at JMS, at the Jim Master Show Live Series. This is archived. You can see the entire episode in full on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. We appreciate Christopher. It's a very busy time for him because the book just came out. So we appreciate him taking time to stop by the Jim Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series to not only talk about the book and remember this iconic figure, extraordinary songwriter, librettist, actor here and there, <laughs> and prolific uh, producer and playwright, the incomparable Terrence McNally celebrated here. We lost him uh, not that long ago, just a couple years ago during the uh, pandemic. And uh, it was a uh, shocking loss to many. And uh, we had an opportunity to, to revel in his memory and also introduce you to Christopher and his incredible work. Really terrific having him on and chatting about uh, also his love of toys, a kid at heart. Yes, he's all excited because the toy season is upon us. You got a chance to not only learn more about Terrence, but also about our very special guest, Christopher Byrne, coming to us again, live and direct from New York City. Now, if you want to get a copy of this book before they sell out, <laughs> go to Amazon and there is the exact way to do it. You can just go to amazon.com, type in his name, type in the title of the book, and it'll come right up for you. The Kindle version is available too. And there's the Terrence McNally Foundation.org, which helps support theater, which I think is a beautiful thing. We wanted to make mention of that and hopefully help the foundation as well, which I think is a terrific, terrific thing. Now, gang, if you enjoyed this episode, there is something special we would love for you to do. What is that? Well, that is give this episode a thumbs up like on our YouTube channel where we house almost a thousand episodes of our series. You'll see a big thumb, maybe not as golden and shiny and glitzy as this one is here on our show, but it's a big like button. Give it a like, drop a comment for us. Yeah, leave a comment. We're very interactive. And also don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. There's a big subscribe button. We love when you do that. It helps us grow. We have audience of thousands and thousands and thousands who watch from all around the world. So we thank you very much for, for that. And uh, of course, we've had so many iconic folks stop by the Gym Masters show who love what we do and appreciate what we do. And one of them just had a knockout out of the park week of shows at 54 below. Our dear friend, the iconic Lucy Arnez. Hey, Jim, congratulations. That's quite a milestone. I've always enjoyed talking to you. You do a great show, positive, optimistic, interested. You do your homework. We love being with you, and I hope we get a chance to do it again sometime. With love from Lucy Arnez and Larry Leckenbill. Right back at you, Lucy. She had some iconic shows this week at uh, 54 Below. And she really is a uh, master. We love Lucy. We love Melissa Manchester, too. Hi, this is Melissa Manchester. Happy third anniversary, Gym Masters. I'm so happy for your achievements thus far with no end in sight. I was delighted to be invited uh, to be on your show twice. And we had um, a lovely time discussing my career and achievements and and what struck me was how how delightful the tone was it was not um you were not looking for any gotcha moments you know you were you jim are interested apparently in restoring the art of conversation and with that the concept of levity which i just find charming and encouraging and delightful so i look forward to chatting with you again dear jim and congratulations again for, for making a space where people can share their ideas, where you can ask thoughtful, probing questions to see how we're all doing uh, on our paths, our parallel paths. 
So wishing you uh, many, many more happy anniversaries. Long may love a tea wave and you too. Be well. Thank you, Melissa Manchester. You know, somebody else who is well known in the theater world and cabaret world and on stage, the incomparable performer, Jeff Harner. He was a guest on our show too, loved it and wanted to send these thoughts. Hi, Jim. It's Jeff Harner here, wishing you a happy, happy anniversary. Congratulations on your three-year milestone. Three years is huge in any industry, but in the entertainment industry, it's really significant. I am so grateful to have been one of your guests on your program. I uh, had the gift of being the recipient of your intelligent, compassionate, empathetic, warm, um, clever sense of humor and uh, deeply empathetic listening ears. I, um, I think our interview was supposed to be 45 minutes and it stretched to be 90 minutes and it's not because you were talking, it's because you were listening to me and I am so grateful. So long may you wave, uh, you give such a gift of service to your audiences and to the entertainers, you shine such an attractive spotlight on all of us. Onwards and upwards, lots of love. We thank Jeff for that as well. Thanks, Jeff Harner. We appreciate those kind words and everybody else who has sent these fabulous words as well. Hope you're doing well, gang. Thanks for being with us. I'm your host, Jim Masters. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And we thank once again our very special guest. Thanks for all these comments coming in here, too. We really appreciate them all. Uh, that means the world to us. We thank our very special guest, Christopher Byrne, for joining us live and direct from New York City, author, theater critic, a man of much importance. Make sure you pick that up at Amazon. Really a terrific, terrific book, The Art and Life of Terrence McNally. Maybe this is the first time you've heard of Terrence McNally, possibly. Now you knew about somebody who contributed to the theater world, music, entertainment, the arts in not only you know the theater world opera film television many different genres and platforms and avenues as well so we thank uh, our very special guest joining us here on the show christopher byrne and we thank all of you uh let's see kathleen says we'll check in with a couple of our lovely viewers and see what everybody's saying if you want to support our show uh super sticker super chat super emoji that's all available. Super thanks in the Love at Each Hall chat room when the shows are live. Or you can also uh, check it out later at Super Thanks, which is a hard icon that they have on the YouTube channel. And it's available 24-7. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Jim. Great show. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, Jane says, thank you, Christopher, for being here tonight. Thanks, Jim. You now want to start collecting matchbox cars. <laughs> They're expensive now. <laughs> Glad we saved ours from childhood. Thanks to everybody. Thumbs up from Merlin as well and everybody watching from around the world. We appreciate it. You have a great day wherever you're watching. And thanks for stopping by this episode of the Gym Masters Show Live. Don't keep it a secret. Tell everybody you know about our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series. And we're working hard to continue to entertain, inform, Educate and just have a good time with all of you right here at JMS. Be well, gang. Cheers. I'll see you on the next episode of the Gym Master Show. Take care. Mm -hmm.